34-year-old male complains of pain on the sole of the foot. He reports that it feels like he's walking on glass, especially in the morning. His history is unremarkable except that he has recently started an exercise program three times a week to combat his obesity. Upon examination, he has point tenderness along the plantar surface of the foot and pain upon passive stretch. What is the most likely diagnosis? Plantar fasciitis is definitely the most common of these, especially in conjunction with obesity, increased activity levels, and this uh, early morning pain that he was discussing. So those are all key features of um, plantar fasciitis. Shin splints are going to be microtraumas as the muscle attaches along the periosteum, and they tend to um, be sore at the beginning and after activity, but tend to be okay during an activity. Compartment syndrome gets worse during activity and will oftentimes be pale and blanched out. Stress fractures will be fairly consistent. Um, this is a possibility, but it would be more pain associated with the dorsum of the foot as opposed to the plantar surface and the tibialis posterior strain would have uh, referral through the activity of plantar flexion. If you have a 17-year-old female who's admitted to the hospital with a high fever following intravenous administration of antibiotics, routine examination revealed a cervical rib. If she were to develop a thoracic outlet syndrome, which symptoms would be the most likely? Weakness of the hand and the numbness in the upper limb. There could be a reduced blood flow to the thoracic wall because of a reduction, but clinically this is going to be a subclinical finding. So when we look at an extra cervical rib or thoracic outlet syndrome, um, there are three major types. There's a neurogenic type, which is going to cause brachial plexus injuries and have a, uh, documented electromyography change in conduction studies. A vascular type, which is going to be a compression of the subclavian artery or vein which uh, can become thrombosed or documented through an arteriogram where you can actually see the compression. Or a nonspecific um, thoracic outlet syndrome where they may have symptoms but no obvious reason for the symptoms to be showing up, at least from an anatomical standpoint. So if we're looking at a newborn male infant who's experiencing respiratory distress, he has no fever and has fluid in his lungs. Several hours later, he's breathing normally and his lungs are clear. The likely explanation of this would be that the infant was suffering from what condition? Here, we're looking for wet lung. Since this was a transient uh, ischemic issue, not having a fever or any other respiratory distress syndrome uh, conditions that uh, basically um, cleared itself up, this is typical of wet lung. And a wet lung is when there's still fluid transition from coming out of the embryonic stage and into the infant stage. Uh, it can take a little bit of time, up to 8 to 12 hours perhaps even, to clear the fluids from the lungs and start replacing that with air. In fact, looking at the lungs being wet or air-filled is one pathological way that they'll look whether or not an infant was born still or not. If an infant's born still, they'll have fluid in the lungs. If the infant was born alive and then died or was uh, killed, then they will have air in their lungs. That means they have taken breaths.